There is a certain finality about the clank of the prison gate behind us as it rolls shut. Even as visitors, we had the sense that we are now in captivity. Inside these walls at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is Dr. Mutulu Shakur. He pioneered the use of acupuncture in the treatment of addiction during the drug plague that swept in and took on epidemic proportions during the escalation of the Vietnam War after 1965. Hardest hits were the black and Latin communities. Among the worst was the South Bronx, where young people literally were lying in the street from the effects of drugs. The problem of how to fight this new scourge was on the minds of every organizer. Mutulu Shakur was part of a movement that included the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, and the Republic of New Africa that had taken over the Lincoln Hospital demanding drug detoxification programs for the South Bronx. The takeover led to the formation of Lincoln Detox, where these pioneering treatments were developed as an alternative to government-sponsored programs that pushed methadone, an equally addictive synthetic drug used as a substitute for heroin, as the solution. Mutulu Shakur has been behind these bars for the last 13 years. As he sat down on the table across from us, he took out a clipping from his folder with a picture of slain rap artist Tupac Shakur. This is my son, he said. With this very personal comment, Mutulu began to unfold the story of a struggle for social activism and alternative medicine, particularly acupuncture, as a method for fighting the drug epidemic, and how doing this pitted them against the whole government establishment. Those were tumultuous times. There were protests and rebellions and repression amidst the steady drumbeat of the body bags coming back from Vietnam. Funerals occurred in the black and Latin and Native American communities with far greater frequency than elsewhere. Many in the black and Latin community felt they were the victims of an undeclared war, something called COINTELPRO, short for the counterintelligence program of the FBI and the big city police departments. Many leaders were cut down in the midst of critical struggles by the police or assassins' bullets from Reverend Martin Luther King to Malcolm X to Fred Hampton and so many others. The drugs flooded in everywhere, relentlessly, from campuses to the community, particularly after protests or unrest. And so many were jailed. Many were to remain in those prisons for decades. Prison population began to skyrocket, so that today there are five times as many prisoners as three decades ago. Organizers in the community, like Mutulu Shakur, saw this as an effort to criminalize and destroy a generation of youth, rebellious youth, a plague brought on by the establishment that saw getting people high as the answer to the conditions of poverty and the weekly death toll from the war that had people seething with anger in the late 1960s and early 70s. We were able to demonstrate that social and political activity, along with acupuncture, would help detoxify people off of drugs quicker than just. Lincoln Detox had become the center of that movement to fight drugs with acupuncture and the struggle for social justice. Yeah, and that's my favorite line of work, healing. I think I do that better than I do anything else. Could you tell our audience a little bit about your history as a political activist, as a revolutionary? You know, just give us a, a brief overview of who you are and really why you're here in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. That's a two-pronged question. Why am I here in the Atlanta Federal, Federal Penitentiary is a long story about the treatment of political prisoners and prisoners of war within the context of U.S. prison system in particular. Uh, who I am, I believe, reflects their attitude towards me. Uh, I think that uh, I am 
considered a part of the New African Independence Movement. And that movement recruited me at the age of 15. I was uh, involved with a man in a community called South Jamaica, Queens. And I think that anybody who knows anything about New York knows that South Jamaica, Queens is considered a middle class black neighborhood. And uh, the most interesting thing about that neighborhood was that all of the people in the 60s, late 50s, who had responsibility for the broad community, for the extended family in our community, the teachers, the uh, nurses, the principals, the cops even, the firemen, were all very race conscious people. So we came from a community that had Sekou Odinga, who had Asada Shakur, who had uh, Herman Ferguson. Mm -hmm. So we grew up in a very self, uh, a race conscious time. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I was 13 or 14, I became a son of a man by Abdul Shakur. Saladin Abdul Shakur. And he was the father. Actually, I was 12. He was the father of Lumumba Shakur and Zaid Shakur. For those people who don't know who Lumumba Shakur is, the famous Panther 21 case was Lumumba Shakur at all. And that was my brother. And Zaid Shakur was the comrade who was killed when Asada Shakur was captured on the New Jersey Turnpike. Both of them were, their father took me in. I have no biological father, I mean, I must have a biological father, but I have no father in that respect. And he, I became a part of that family at the age of 11 and 12. And so, we were all very conscious people. And Herman Ferguson was the principal of the school in which uh, one of the schools, one of the important schools in the community uh, that allowed for us to read and understand our history, understand community control. He was a very influential in the Southeast Queens Community Corporation, uh, Jamaica Community Corporation. These are uh, organizations that took care of the fundamental needs of the community. And so he took me in as my political father. So I had great mentors during my very, very early age. I didn't always do what they said, but I was always dependent on them for guidance. And I knew that when in doubt, they had the direction. And so at the age of 15, I went to um, the under Sonny Carson when he was at the South, when he was in the Old Shoe Hill Browns mm -hmm. Athletic School for Common Sense. So, and Sonny Carson was my street father. Mm -hmm. He was like someone who knew the streets and who mm -hmm. was in Brooklyn. And so we always, you know, had that kind of surround. So I was recruited essentially into the Black Liberation Movement through these men. And, um, I believe that that's what put me in the position I'm in, I am today. And that is that I feel good about myself. I feel that I have dedicated my life to a worthy cause. I think that there must be place in the world for dreamers, and I'm a dreamer. And I think that the dreamers are the people who put into the reality what we wish could happen because they fight for it. And I think that uh, the New African Independence Movement through these men have advanced and has stayed strong for a long period of time. And it's our time to take over. Now I'm almost 50, and so we look to the youth mm -hmm. to take over from where we are. But um, that's where I came from as a child. Mm -hmm. The Republic of New Africa, is the organization that I joined at the age of 17. While my brothers joined the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. 
I, after going to Newark and Philadelphia for the Black Power Convention, was quite impressed with, uh, you might know him as Milton Henry, but Brother Gaidi. Milton Henry was the man that was with Malcolm X when he went abroad to organize the strategy of putting the issue of black people before the United Nations mm -hmm. at the same time, or part of the proposed uh, anti-apartheid proposal that was being backed by the various governments that was back in A ANC for uh, making apartheid a international crime. Mm -hmm. And so the strategy to put um, black people's plight before the United Nations was helped develop through a man by the name of Milton Henry, who was an attorney out of Detroit, to us known as Brother Gaidi. Mm -hmm. And Brother Gaidi and his brother, Brother Imari Obadelli, mm -hmm. who is the president, now the president mm -hmm. of the Republic of Africa, were some of the most passionate speakers for self-determination that I have ever met at the age of 17. Mm -hmm. While I had met Elwich Cleveland, and I had met uh, Bobby Seals, and I had met uh, David Hilly, and was mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there was something absent in my mind from the strategy. I supported wholeheartedly the 10 point program, I supported wholeheartedly the right to self defense. I supported wholeheartedly internationalizing our struggle. I supported wholeheartedly uh, community control. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what the Ocean Hill Brownsville struggle was about, our struggle mm -hmm. for school boards and, and that. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was very important stuff. But I thought that it did not have an end. So when the Republic of North Africa presented itself, and I went to uh, Detroit to meet with with Brother Herman and Brother Arthur Harris, who's been in exile almost for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, we, and Sister Nelda, we became very much impressed with the Republic of New Africa's position of five southern states. And so I became a member, a citizen. I renounced my American citizens at about 16 or 17. And I became a citizen of the Republic of New Africa. Prior to becoming a citizen of the Republic of New Africa, I had participated in the Peace and Freedom, uh, no, Freedom and Peace Party with mm -hmm. Brother Herman Ferguson. There was the Peace and Freedom, and then there was the Freedom and Peace. Well, while Elwich Cleaver and Angela Davis ran on the Peace and Freedom, uh, Herman Ferguson and others ran on the Freedom and Peace. And I was part of his campaign. Matter of fact, it was only two or three of us a part of this campaign uh, coordination committee. And we went all over the United States, I mean all over the New York State to get dollars. Was this in 1968? 1968. And we experienced a very, very important thing. We were able to talk to people of all races and colors and explain to them why Herman Ferguson was running for black people to separate from New York State. And so from both sides of the coin, we were able to see why people supported the position to separate from the United States. I mean, from New York State mm -hmm. at that time. While white people supported our right to separate, and while black people supported our need to separate. And so, on the tail end of the Ocean Hill Brownsville struggle, while we were involved in exposing what power really meant in controlling the school board, here we had an electoral, electoral campaign which was about the separation of powers of the people, giving each people their quantity of quality of power and self-government and self-control of their lives. Mm -hmm. And through electoral politics, that referendum became a very important thing. And so we ran. Uh, we, we, got, uh, we were able to put uh, Herman Ferguson on the ballot. We were able to solicit support from all over the uh, state. This is for president. 
Well, what, 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 we paralleled each other. Mm -hmm. you know, one was community and one was dealing with the overall issue. And so, and so what we have is a impasse that for a while in terms of which way we were going to go in terms of separation or community control. And whether or not separation meant division from a people or power, separation mm -hmm. of power. So at an early age, I was able to understand the distinction between racism and self-government and self-reliance. And in 1968, Herman ran for Senate. Herman Ferguson ran for Senate. And he was able to campaign all over the state. And it was a very, very, very exciting time for me because the option of electoral politics was put squarely before me as a young man. And while listening to, at the time, this is right after Martin Luther King had died, mm -hmm. but many other people talking about uh, that Percy Sutton was a part of the Democratic uh, Club, I knew all of them. Gibson, Mayor Gibson, they all had us under their tutelage in electoral politics. They were real, all very impressed with Herman Ferguson's ability to get on the ballot. And uh, they were very impressed with our campaign. Uh, and I think that at the time that he uh, became uh, clearly on the ballot, the, the black political strategy had to shift and he had to get his voice in all of the forums that was happening at the time. And so I think that uh, the Black Panther Party in New York City, in New York State in fact, came out clearly in support of Herman Ferguson, mm -hmm. which was in somewhat contradiction to the support for Elwood Cleaver and and not, they're not particularly Elvis Stevens and Andrew Davis, but they had a person that they were running for Senator Two on the Peace and Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. So those discussions happened. So we all understood that electoral politics was not in, in, in and of mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And so that love and that unity just bonded mm -hmm. what we considered the Republican New Africa and the Black Panther mm -hmm. Party mm -hmm. within New York and it would always stay the same. Mm -hmm. And so, in 1968, after Ferguson, Herman Ferguson lost the election, you know, obviously lost the election, but our success was tremendous. We proposed to separate Ocean Hill Brownsville from New York State. Matter of fact, from America. Because the people in Ocean Hill Brownsville were fed up with what had happened with the school board mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the Republic of New Africa solicited the support of other organizations to ease the African Teachers Association, a number of uh, groups. And we ran a ballot, a referendum, and they had to elect representatives from each block, block associations to be elected to come to Detroit to hear the proposal of the Republic of New Africa. And so in that election, we were able to get as much participation as a congressional election in that, in that area, in that notion of Brownsville at that time. And 10 people were elected by their ballots and they had a few put on the ballot, they ran, they mean the whole process. So they were elected and they were sent to Detroit for, as representatives of Ocean Hill Brownsville to, to determine whether or not the option of voting through the process already established in the so-called American Constitution to secede from New York State. Now, you have to remember 
back then, I think Floyd McKissick had a little separate enclave. There was an Oscar Brown senior had a little enclave because there were different thoughts about that issue. It was a real issue. So we went to Detroit in 69. And 69 was at, at the New Bethel Church, Aretha Franklin's Father's mm -hmm. Church. These 10 representatives who were finishing our conference on the issue. And at this conference and at this church, at the age of 18, I became very clear that the question of separating from black from America, separating black people from America by controlling its resources was one of the most dangerous things that you could do. Because in that church, with men and women and children of all ages, the United States government sent up to 300 police and shot that church up and tried to kill everybody in that church. And I happened to be on security at the time. And that, the defense of that church, the defense of those people, by members of the, uh, the Republic of New Africa, the Black Legion, was some of the most historic, I mean, heroic show of love for a people that I have ever seen at that time. And it was one of the things that crystallized in me that we could not have a movement, a serious movement, if we were not prepared to defend ourselves against attack. And I think that the attack on New Bethel was not just an attack against the Republic of New Africa. It was an attack against Ocean Hill Brownsville for electing these people and sending them to Detroit to even investigate the possibility of succeeding from New York State. And that we know now today, after the trial and all the way up, that this was one of the highest strategic co-intel programs of that period. And so, when we look at what happened in New Bethel, and we understand what happened in New Bethel, then we have a better understanding of what happened in Moon. You see? Mm -hmm. And then when we realize that president at all at that time the person that we elected to be president was Robert F. Williams in his own crystallized. Because Robert F. Williams, if history does right, if we learn our history within the proper context, Robert F. Williams was the main person in the contemporaneous revolutionary black masses movement and or black movement to pose the fundamental question of self-defense. And we do not recognize that. We as a people do not recognize that Robert Williams was significant. Mm -hmm. We always think that the struggle between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X it was a struggle between militancy and non-militancy. When, in fact, the truth is, is that Robert F. Williams' role as the leader of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina, put the issue of self-defense before one of the most entrenched integrationist organizations of the NAACP. And that, that is where the split happened first. That's the first split. We always talk about the pamphlet split. Mm -hmm. And we always seem to talk about the split between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And that's because people really don't want to deal with the fundamental question. And that is that even if you accept that we will disagree on which way forward as a people, 
we must accept the fact that we have some responsibility to defend in whatever way that we think is the way we should go forward. Mm -hmm. And even if we as individuals don't feel that it's our responsibility to prepare for that defense, we must accept that it must happen. And when those brothers and sisters who take it on as their responsibility to defend our right to pursue a political objective are incarcerated, it's incumbent upon all freedom-loving people to support them. Mm -hmm. And see, and that's at the crux of why Jericho is important. That's at the crux of why Mamiya cannot be killed. Mm -hmm. He cannot be executed. Because if we allow him to be executed in the context of the case that they have orchestrated against him, we will then damper any attempt of our people to defend ourselves and our right to fight for human rights and human dignity. We all have individual responsibility. We all have individual responsibility. But we must also have a collective protective consciousness. Those two working together, we will be able to bring our expectations as a people. And I'm not just talking about black people, I'm talking about people suffering. Mm -hmm. To bring our expectations as a people to a certain level of fruition. Mm -hmm. But if we're all individuals, I might talk too long. No, that's, no it's, this is great. A lot of people don't know. This is, people don't know about this history. That's the main thing. He founded the Deacons for Self-Defense. Yes, the yeah. Deacons. I mean, we, there's a whole history being evolved by new historians that are mm -hmm. evolving from the new African independence movement. Mm -hmm. But that history cannot be buried in our archives and the black institutions. It must be resurrected right. because our youth must understand from once we come right. and what it's going to take to survive. Right. And so I was talking about the individual responsibility and the collective protective consciousness. I think that uh, the struggle that we waged in the Republic of New Africa was not an isolation of what was happening with the Black Panther Party. In fact, while people only knew of the Black Panther Party, they did not know as much on the so-called border states, you know, East Coast and West Coast, about the Republic of New Africa. Mm -hmm. But our collective consciousness, our collective, collective protective consciousness was so intense, uh, and I'm saying uh, our, and I'm talking about myself and all of us who came up as brothers and sisters out of South Jamaica, Queens, mm -hmm. uh, because when I was let out of jail in New Bedford and came to New York, they had just arrested all of the Panther 21. Mm -hmm. And so my brother was in jail, his wife was in jail, Fanny was in jail, all the comrades that I know. So while they were attacking us in Detroit, they were doing a, a, a sweep in New York. And our collective sense of desperate, not necessarily desperation, but this is a war. This is a war. We're, they're after us, so let's get it on. You know, I mean, that, that's what we, we came up with. And, and when we came to New York, after just going through the experience where they tried to kill us, they beat us, they tortured us, they tried to they, they, uh, suffocate us with carbon dioxide, uh, and then to come to tell the stories of how you held on and how brave uh, sisters and brothers protected the children while the bullets ate up the pews and, and shared with people who would understand it and to finally say to 
my brothers and my comrades in the Panther Party. That Republican New Africa is down just like y'all, you know. That was, you know, and then they go off. They're in jail. They're running. They're hiding. And so you, you don't have time to reflect. You have to do what you can to assist, to help, and to guide, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and no one's taught us. You know, we, we have never even been, some of us have never been to Vietnam. Some of us have never been to the military school. Some of us, we didn't know anything except what we read. And so we were fighting a sophisticated government that had shown over years that they could topple other, other, other governments. Mm -hmm. They were continually oppressing other governments. And here we are, sneakers, leather coat, field jackets from Army and Navy store, meeting in basements, never seeing a tap in our life. What is a tap? We hear the word, we never, we never seen a tap. We couldn't tell if it was sitting right in front of us. We were unprepared for that type of resistance. But we were not afraid. See? We were not afraid. And so we did the best that we could. Members of the Black Panther Party and members of the New African Freedom Fighters, you know, uh, the Black Liberation Army, you know, they did the best that they could. We had no territory to train. And so what did we do the best that we could against? And it was, if everybody saw that they were beating, bullies was beating up on a little guy. When you're walking down the street, you see five or six big guys beating a little guy. The tendency for somebody to come to the little guy's aid is more apparent then. But if you don't see the five or six big guys beating on the little guy, and all you see is these little guys running around yelling, fire, fire, they killing us. Oh, you guys is a bunch of bums. You guys is a bunch of radical hoodlums. You have no work. And so we were being attacked by the biggest sophisticated intelligence operation in the world, mm -hmm. outside of the Kremlin at that time. And we did not have training and sophistication to deal with. And I think that when we look at the eventual development of the state of Israel, we become clearer about how important the Messiah was to the state of Israel. Then we understand what our movement needs to happen. You mean the secret police in Israel? Not only this question of secret police, the right of a nation to have in place an intelligence operation to prevent counterintelligence against their ability to grow and develop. Whether I support Mossad or don't support Mossad, that's immaterial. I'm saying we had no infiltration into the CIA. We had no infiltration into the FBI. The movie, the movie uh, I forget who put it, the spook who stepped by the door, that was fiction. We, we had a collective consciousness and we hoped that a black cop, once we had picketed and struck and, and, and rallied for him to get a job, where at the time we got to the precinct would do the right thing, but there was, there, that was no organized predictability. That was collective consciousness hoping that once we integrated, that we will all look at our own. But that integration is something different than what we're talking about. And so the counterintelligence program, when Mumia goes about as an investigative report to determine whether or not the bomb that fell in 79, 78, well, 79 in uh, August, on move on Osage Avenue, mm -hmm. whether or not that bomb, no, the bomb no, came in 85. 85, okay, 85, but I'm talking about in 70, 78, in 78, whether or not they were justified in the shooting and the fire and all that. 
No one else was going to do that for our movement except somebody who cared. And he was a part of the Black Panther Party, so he knew he had to look for the hidden agenda because these people were going to trial. Mm -hmm. You see? And so if we don't have an investigative skills in our own community to investigate the things that are going on, to understand the distinction between disinformation and information, and to counter the counterintelligence, then we will be victimized consistently by counterintelligence. And so, under international law, when some a person's history is so connected to the belligerence, rebellion, or riots of a people who are oppressed, that person cannot be perceived as a criminal. And under domestic law, Mamir is being tried as a criminal. How can he be a criminal? What right do they have to try him as a criminal? If he was extradited to England or any other country, before they would send him back to America on a warrant, they would sit down and say, under the extradition treaties that we have, is this man a criminal? Well, let's look at the case. Well, it just seems like it was a shooting. One guy had a gun, he was shooting at someone, and somebody ended up dead. Two people were shot. Well, who is this guy? And then they had to decide, well, he was in the Black Panther Party when he was a young, he was a journalist when he became an adult. He was an investigative journalist. He was a part of the movement. Well, is he a criminal? Well, we can't say he's a criminal. Well, if we send him back, will his political activities be used against him in a criminal proceeding? Yes, it will. Well, then we won't send him back under international law. So if he fits the criteria under the political offense exception to extradition, then why are we allowing the United States government to execute him as a criminal. They were, they're outside of that jurisdiction. But we don't claim international law. They don't recognize international law. We still look for the United States within its system to treat him fairly because we still feel a part of this system. But our struggle separates us under international law from domestic law because the tendency of the oppressive government is to treat all resistance as if it's criminal. Mm -hmm. Right. You see. And so if we don't draw a line in the sand around a meal, who will we draw it? Because if we do not trigger international protection for just struggle, I mean, we look at the IRA, we look at the PLO, we look at the at Bosnia, we look at Serbia. I mean, look at the system. I mean, the, 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 the war trials that is going on in in, in, in um, Bosnia now, and 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 the young man who said that his uh, general told him to slaughter all of these people, and he. The United States or the, the United Nations, through the leadership of the United States, gets a black woman lawyer from Texas to defend him. And she does a tremendous job defending him. And she defends him because he did not understand his implications. I mean, she's done it under international, not under human law, whether or not it was wrong or not, but under international law. And she begs for this man's life, not to be executed. And you know, they spanned this man's life, not to say that they should know they should. That's not the point. But he had a fair venue. They're not giving him a mere fair venue. They're not giving him a fair venue because we did have a war in 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, all the way up. We did have a war. We had a war, a racial war, just like they had over there. The only reason we weren't slaughtered 
by whites because we defended ourselves as much as we could. But you have what Robert Williams was saying, they were shooting at him. I mean, that's look at Ahmed Evans in Cleveland. Died in jail, cancer, other spine, and no one even knows of him. There's so many of the people who defended our community, who went to jail under the criminal law, who was not seen by the Red Cross, who was not protected by international observers, who Amnesty International didn't support, who have died in these jails, and they have been heroes of our struggle. And we haven't done nothing about it. We must draw a line in the sand from the We must do that. Because, I mean, Hugo Bernal, I mean, we can go on and on and on and uh, time on a lot. But we must really understand the context in which our struggle, this is not a phase, it's a long struggle. Mm -hmm. It's a long struggle. And so, um, Colin Telfer was not only physical, it was mental. By refusing or putting people in a position to feel that if they supported the people who fought for them, by putting them in a position to feel that they would be targeted, that they would be uh, imprisoned under the grand jury system, that they would lose their jobs, that they would take their children, that they might have to snitch on a comrade. The psychological and emotional pressure that comes with that type of threat cannot be underestimated. I mean, even more so than the war, because that's what has paralyzed our movement today in 1998. We have a paralyzed movement the J. Edgar Hoover Co-Intel program was one of the most sophisticated programs. We cannot take it from it. It was vicious, but it served its objective. And so, Co-Intel Pro, low intensity warfare, a legitimate military tactics in low intensity warfare. And low intensity warfare is just a method of warfare that is disguised in order not to bring in outside observers. And so when we're getting ready to have a rally, hopefully one of the biggest rallies we've had in some time in Washington to support the existence of political prisons, to acknowledge that, the President of the United States goes to Africa. Right. <laughs> Isn't that how ironic? It sure is. He goes to Africa. When masses of people have, have supported Nelson Mandela here in the United States, at the sacrifice of other freedom fighters here, while we were in jail supporting his freedom, our people were supporting the freedom of a political prisoner in South Africa and not even acknowledging that we existed. And I don't think we exist without contradictions. But it, that's not an acid test, because if that was an acid test, the criticism around Mandela would be different too. I mean, the Winnie Mandela situation and all of that, I'm not here to discuss that. I think that they have the right to resolve their own contradictions like we have a responsibility to resolve ours. But I do think that it is a clear contradiction that you can support people who fight for their liberation 6,000 miles away and not support yours here. Of course, the role of the media the big business media had a, has a big part in terms of not even letting people know that there's a Matula Shakur that exists and, you know, us to demonize the liberation fighters here through the media because, you know, the role of the media is just so insidious. It's all part of the COINTELPRO 
program, you know, except for a few alternative media here and there this, that let people know that, you know, political prisoners do exist. That's where you individual know. responsibility comes in. Uh, when you look at uh, the movie Rosewood, mm -hmm. uh, you look at the new and upcoming actors and the power that they are getting, the work and the whole, the Malcolm X period back a couple of years ago. I mean, the search for the mafia type to present. The, I mean, there's so many historical, I mean, heroic, uh, I mean, Shasha Brown was just a tremendous human being for us in the 60s, I mean, in the 70s. Twyman Myers, a young man who fought hard for black people, who was shot over 40 times in the streets of the Bronx. I mean, we're talking about, you want adventure? I mean, you're looking for these type of uh, so-called tough guys? There's so many. Uh, Frankie May Adams, Asada Shakur, Nahanda Ibn Ibn you know? I mean, what are we talking about? Where are you going for your adventure? Make stories out of my heroes. Why you gotta go somewhere to find that? That's your responsibility. That was not the media. You can disguise it. You don't have to say their real name. And then let them search for the truth. You think all the stories we see on the TV about the mafia is true? All the names are true? No, they just give you a bunch of soup and you go for it. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. When I was in Southern Africa in Zimbabwe during the war, and I was able to see that we have an impression that only those people who stand up straight, look clear, are going to be the ones at the end of the victory. It was good to be around the victory in an African nation because it's all of us. It takes all of us to win. You know what I mean? It takes everybody to get with it, to win. You know, we need a collective consciousness to bring our expectations up higher what we think our reality should be. We cannot win without our actors. Because they set some kind of facade, you know, imagination. They, they extend the imagination. The media is not going to champion the two of you call. I don't I don't have European features. I got dread with gray hair. I got a gap in my mind. I'm not the image. They can't work with this. You follow me? They can't work with it. This is not what supports their program. You see? And so I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at us. We have to be about what we can do. I mean, if that means uh, one of the things about the rappers and the hip hop is that they, they take their own leaders and their own groups and their own standards. And they, they say, this is us. And they have to transform and they go back and forth. But we must have impact on them. That's what I used to argue with Tupac about. Mm -hmm. We must have impact on them. I mean, they pick and choose who they want to be their leaders, who they culturally want to identify. Tommy Hill, Pickle Pickle, whatever his name is. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, who is he? And what is he to them? But they adopt him. Because in the sources and in the vibe, they put, Tommy puts their clothes, his clothes, mm -hmm. on them. You see? And so, Versace, I mean, who is he to them, for real? I mean, not necessarily, I mean, just who is he? Who was he to them? Did he do anything that they should be happy about? But did anybody tell them that? You know? And I'm saying that these kinds of things, we can have impact on. But our Dr. Caucus of the few, we talk about the past. The present. 
is that some of the eyes are cold. Psycho a ding. Crazy bottle boom. You know, these people are some great human beings with faults like any other human being, but they ours. Thirty years in jail for you go for them. Thirty years in jail. And all these prison strokes, con air, this one, that. Please, look at some of the call people that's in prison who for standing up and who continues to stand up today. And so, Cohen Telco has paralyzed us from even accepting our responsibility to tell the story. We'll tell the story about Queen Zingu or King Chaka Zulu or the, the Middle Passage or the, the slavery. I mean, we don't talk about Ahmed Evans. We don't talk about Robert Williams. You know, we don't talk about people who that impact because it, it divides us. It divides us. We talk about Mayor Daly. We don't talk about Fred Hampton. We don't talk about Fred Hampton. The young artist, I mean, there's been no movie. Forget the documentation. Even if you distort it a little, like they distort everything. Mm -hmm. Talk about Fred Hampton, the great articulator of the system. The young, powerful Panther, who had nothing but love for his people and daring audaciousness who they came and drugged and shot and killed. How dramatic can you get? What kind of creative license you need to make a good story out of that? You ain't working with nothing if you can't find something to make good with that. You see, and so we don't control most of that. And right now, our children have a void where I feel like I'm a teenager because I feel more aggressive and hipper than most of these children that I, I'm in prison with. Because under 30, they act like they're children. When I was 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, we were in the pit of resistance. We were power to the people. You know, we were running at night and ducking and dodging, and, and we loved the free breakfast program. We love to help the sister to the bus stop. We love to protect the sister when she's being harassed by the police. We love ran, running the landlord off, off the property, trying to uh, burn up the apartment building. Ed Dumaji, what a hell of a man. He helped more people get homes and housing and decent housing in the Bronx. How? He is a political prisoner. His life has been about fighting for black people. His life has been about we all got our errors, but only he's a political prisoner. He is a prisoner of war. And someone should tell the story. But Cole and Tell don't allow you to tell the story because they talk about he shot two cops. They don't tell you about how they killed Harold Russell. Who his, his, his best friend and got him up in the hallway and shot him all up. And that dude had to find his body when he was a panther selling papers instead of being around there, being able to help and protect him. They're going to tell you that side. And I'm not here to su support one side or the other. I'm talking about history now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the true history. And I'm talking about Cole and Telco paralyzing us as a people. Mm -hmm. Look what it's done to the white left. It has destroyed the white left. We have some very tremendous, beautiful people in the white anti-imperialist movement that have supported the new African independence movement. Now, obviously, there's been a coalition between the white left and the Marxist in this movement of the black left, you know, for years. But I'm talking about, in particular, white anti-imperialists, white people, who have supported black people's right for self-determination and has supported it with their lives, freedom, and, and everything else that goes with it. Don't hear about that, man. Sylvia's the story. 
Sylvia Balladine is a story. Marilyn Buck is a story. Mm -hmm. She is a story. You know. And they're beautiful people. Good human beings. Susan Rosenberg. I mean, we can go on and on. I'm not, you know, trying to isolate any group from another group. I'm just talking about the fact that, uh, you know, it's a long struggle. And the quality of that struggle depends upon our ability to respect it for what it is. It's not an incident. So what do you see in terms of um, the revitalization, you know, of the, a new movement in this country? You know, back in 95, when they were about to execute Mamiya, when Ridge, was it Ridge, signed a death warrant? Governor Ridge signed a death warrant, and, you know, our organization, along with hundreds more of the move organizations and so forth, we had this huge demonstration of 10,000 people that push back, you know, the just death warrant that Rich, you know, had signed. And it was a, you know, incredible display of unity and so forth to stop the execution. So do you see that as a hopeful sign for what's to come in the future, especially with, you know, so many young people who gravitate, young activists who have gravitated around Mamiya's case and now other political prisoners? You know, um, so how do you see, you know, the regrouping of the movement that you say has been, you know, paralyzed by COINTEL? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged uh, by the uh, support. I think uh, Ramona, Ramona Africa did a beautiful job. She came out and she rumbled hard to put things in you know, for move and for Mamiya up front. And I think that that was very good for the prison movement. Uh, I mean, for move in particular mm -hmm. and for Mamiya. Um, I think that uh, we have two more years to go where we can determine whether or not the thrust of 95 is consolidated. Because what we're faced with is an uneven development. We have an escalation of fascist laws that are moving so fast that the ability and the potential of the organizational consolidation that we see that's coming will not be in place in time to prevent the fascist repression is going to take place on those organizations for their support for just cause. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, people are not clear what the anti-terrorist bill definitely had means. People are not clear what the mandatory sentencing means. Mm -hmm. People do not understand the impact of what happens after you're convicted on appeal? Uh, people really now don't understand what happened in Chicago with the Chicago 7, and the laws they have now will make that look like a picnic. Because your association with someone who says that they believe that they have a right to an independent nation will put you on a terrorist list and will allow for them to have your trial in close abstention. You won't know what's going on. There will be no way for mass support to support your trial or to support your uh, hearings or whatever because you won't, nobody will know where that is. Where it was happening, where it's being taken place, who's the judge, who's the prosecutor, you won't know none of that. And they have laws in place right now to do that. They have laws in place right now that if they convict you, if you don't have your, uh, you don't have your issues on appeal together within six months, you will have no more appeal. That's the law. 
They have laws in place that they can forbid you from ever having any more human contact. So are we, I'm encouraged. But this is a vicious, long-range struggle. And what we were saying in the early 90s is that we must hurry up and get together because in order to change the rules of engagement, we must be able to challenge the electoral process that's putting these bills and acts in place. Or those people who join now are in much worse situation than when we were in in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s because at least we fought, we could fight, we understood generally the fight. We didn't understand the game we were fighting. There is no more game. This looks like Argentina in the, in the 50s and the 60s, the way the laws are written at this time. And so are you willing to be put in jail for refusing to talk about your organizational ability, uh, organizational capability to help Joe Schmo, whoever it might be, win a new appeal or a new case. When they connect that person to a conspiracy organization and they connect you to support of that, that organization. That's what laws are in place today. And there's no teachings on those things. And so the commitment must be very, very, very clear that this is a serious struggle. And the only way that we can win, not win, but sustain an ongoing conflict, which we must in order to educate people, is that we must challenge and expose these laws for what they really are. Mm -hmm. This is fascism in America. The 94 election was put forward, the 94th legislation and congressional election put forward some of the most fascist laws in a long, long time. And I'm not sure that, the, and I'm just, I've been in jail for a while, so I can't say. But I'm not sure that the organizations are now willing and able to withstand the type of repression once they unleash it, that, that they're able to unleash on you legally. Legally. So COINTELPRO is not an illegal program now. It's a legal program. It's a legal thing that they can do to you. And those of us from the past, if we're not up on it sufficiently enough, um, I'm not sure what kind of aid we can give to the young because they must take over. And uh, I look at what happens with the, uh, the prison issue. Uh, when you look at the type of people they're putting in jails for this crack versus powder mm -hmm. cocaine, I was so, so uh, emotionally tied to Sister Maxine Waters at the Million mm -hmm. Woman March. Mm -hmm. I was afraid for her. I'm saying, well, who's going to protect her? How is she going to be protected after what she said? Mm -hmm. Because they know exactly what they're doing. They're putting all these black people in jail. And most of these people, even though they were doing very self-destructive stuff, but I can tell you on a case-by-case -case basis that the people who are getting 25, 30, 40 years in jail, the majority of them coming down from the project from the seventh floor Somebody gave them a bag of rocks and said, if you stay in here every day from four to seven, I'll give you and your mama $200. You give me what's in the bag back. Never been off their block. Don't know what a lawyer is. And these people are in this jail, are in these jails, especially the federal jail, mm -hmm. all over America. These are not hard and They're crack sellers. But there's no woodworking job, there's no construction, there's no hanging and no wires no more. Everybody's got cellular phones. There's no putting up poles. The mundane labor that we used to have in the 
50s, 60s, and there, there's no gold. They're selling crack out of a bag, and that's not encouraging. But these people are going to jail for 30 and 40 years. And you know what? I have, I've been in jail almost 13, 14 years. And these people have been in there longer. And we have not seen a black congressional representative come into these jails since I've been in there. There's no excuse for that. Where's the individual responsibility? There has been no black representative that I have seen. And I got a loud mouth. I'm always in something that has been into these institutions. They don't allow black history to come into these institutions. So if you say they should be in jail, are you saying throw the key away? Are you saying that the community are, is not allowed to come in to these prisons? Is that what you want? Is that what the Congressional Black Caucus wants? Is that what liberals want? Do you want no association with the community? Are you going to give the Bureau of Prisons a free hand through NAFTA to run a unicorn of slave labor and finance these races and fascists all over this country and say nothing about it? Is that what you're saying? And for me, Maxine Ward, who's saying what? And I'm saying that the people who can have an impact on these children so that when they come out, their life is like a candle in the wind anyway. But they can join our movement. <laughs> they can join a movement who understand about the laws because they've been a victim of it. They'll be more passionate about it because they've been a victim of it. They'll learn to sit down and understand the difference between power, real power, and, and drug power and all that. They, but they don't want us to talk. That's why I'm here in a lot of penitentiary. I've been locked down. There's many of us locked down all over these prisons who can give some insight, who can help them understand the phenomena they're in, who can help them try to build a connection to, between them and their families and their community. But we don't have a movement that can look at where they can win victories. You see what I'm saying? We look at one incident and we go, ah, and we need to do that. But this is a long, vicious struggle. The masses of black men and now black women who are of the underclass are being put into these jails by the thousands and they will spend the rest of their life in these jails with no possibility of appeal or parole by the millions by 19 and by the 21st century. Who's going to have an impact on that? That's where your forces are going to come from. And we don't have an impact on that because we don't understand the infrastructure of power. We don't understand our collective conscious protection we need among ourselves. So, y'all, and I don't mean y'all, I'm saying in general, support political prison. Sekou's been sent all the way out to, to uh, all the way out to Lompoc to go before a grand jury, something he has nothing to do with. He's, they told him he can't have human contact. This is the kind of power that's being talked about in America today. You will be forbidden to have any human contact. That means you can't have no possibility of saving your humanity. Is that what we're talking about? Is that the kind of world that people are talking about today? Is that what they're willing to accept out there? Or do they see it? Or, they, or don't they see it? You see? And so the prison movement is not just a movement about political prison. Right. It's the political prison is the forefront of a movement that exposes the cornerstone of genocide and fascism. And if you support Jericho, if you support us, you're not just supporting us as personalities. You're supporting us because we haven't rest on our laws. Noah Washington has not rest on his law. Herman, Herman Bell and, and Jaleel haven't rest on. These brothers represent an emotional, political, spiritual threat to the strategy of America, which is lock all these people away, never give them a break, and that's the end of it. And so, 
Can you give me a, can you give our viewers a day in the life of a political prisoner? I mean, what is your day like? You know, I mean, when Mia talked about, he asked people to imagine spending 23 hours a day in your bedroom, you know, in the con small confines of a cell, you know, for many years. Well, that, so, that, well, that, that is what we go through when we are in the control units and the lockdown units. But imagine spending 24 hours a day in your cell with three other people and it's only two bunks. But you're not in a control unit. You're in the hole for nine and 10 months because you're under investigation about God knows what. Imagine that and no one calls you and no one sends you mail and you don't get a phone call. And the phone comes about once every week and your food is cold. See, this is, what they do to us just prepares them for what they can do to the masses. See, they'll poison us and do, they'll have us isolated like we is talking about. Now I've been, I've just, if it wasn't for my court case in Washington, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Florence or in Marion locked down because they've been locking me down because they don't want me talking about the behavior modification and the genocide within the Bureau system, Federal Bureau of Prisons. See, we are locked down. Not only that, imagine being in the position that Mamir talked about. Not being able, I mean, when you come up for parole, you don't see a hard racist. I'm pretty sure that Sundiata, maybe in Jersey, maybe, I'm not sure because he sees, he couldn't see the Jersey boy. But in the feds, you don't see a hard white racist. That's not who you see. You see a black man and a black woman who refuse to give you, not because they want to or don't want to, but the image that they can give you freedom is controlled by Washington. And they hit people with 20 and 30 years. Affirmative action for who? For who? Why? We have to better have a better sense of what we're talking about today. Because when you came in this prison, you see who's running this prison. And it's ridiculous the hate that we hate for ourselves. The fear that they had of the oppressor. That they put so much oppression on us. And they hate me because I'm going to talk about it. And it eats at their consciousness. Prison, if today you have, what gets you is the apathy. You, the apathy. I cry sometimes when I look at these brothers and sisters that I fought to get jobs for. And the young that I hope that we would leave something better for, who have so much self-hate, who are so ignorant of what's happening to them, that they will not see their family for 30 years. I mean, they will see their family, but they will never leave these jails. Because the mandatory sentence says, you cannot leave until you do 85% of your time. And so when you see a person get 40 years, for an incident one crazy person might have done, just like they used the Willie Horton story or some other uh, dramatic incident, and they do it across the board. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I think that a movement for, uh, for political prisons is the first step. Mm -hmm. And we must be the shining light. We must do it right, we must be, you know, strong. You know, they have FAM and they have this program and families against mandatory sentences that, that supports uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Maxine Waters. I mean, she's a very clear sister. I can't put the burden on her. What's happening to all the rest of these people who voted in this, these crime bills? And then what happens in the streets? What's happening in the community? You know, and so, the political prison has to distinguish itself. Why does he have to distinguish itself? Because the war will be between those 
who know why they're fighting and those who are taking advantage of the war. You see, we know why we're fighting. We know that it's just to fight. We know that we must try to correct this issue. Then, those, then there are people who try to take advantage of the conflict to get out of the conflict the goods and services, just like they did in the 60s and the 70s. This affirmative action stuff and this Clarence Thomas syndrome and, and these people who become fascist police just like any other type of police. Uh, you know, these, uh, uh, the economic uh, situation in our community, education in our community. We, we, gotta, we gotta expose them, you know, they're a problem. And so I think that at this time, the Jericho March is coming at a very crucial stage. And I think we're gonna have a very, very wonderful march. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be spirited. I think it's gonna demonstrate a way of hope. I think that we need to be more comprehensive in what's the follow-up. Mm -hmm. We must be more comprehensive in what's the follow-up. But what must be more clear is what are the laws on the books that prevent you from doing this. A Supreme Court ruling says that they did not have to allow you to come and have a face-to-face -face discussion with me. That that First Amendment right is in question with a prisoner because a prisoner loses some of his constitution or her constitutional protection. Who is fighting that? When they took sex books out of the prison, when they took a penthouse and, and, and Playboy and all of that out of the prison. You have to know, and uh, Bob Cachalon, whatever his name, they got together and they paid their lawyers and said, you get in there and you fight for us to sell them sex books to those prisoners. And I ain't mad at them because they fought. They fought. But the right for us to have an interview because of the Mendendez brothers or some other issue out on the West Coast about a uh, Charlie Manson issue. They're gonna prevent people from having direct communication with the press? Who's fighting that? Is it just sitting there? Is the, the ACLU fighting that? Is the Amnesty International fighting that? Uh, what are we really saying when we're talking about fighting for political prisoners? What are we really saying about when we talk about fighting the power or having access to, you know, what is it that we're really saying? And so if we don't use the Jericho March to begin to, front, to confront the fundamental issues that are going to prevent the education and development of a movement to expose fascism, then, you know, we're cannon fodder. We're just going to be cannon fodder for somebody else to get a good name because they gave a great speech. And we're not mm -hmm. doing that. Let's not do that. We've done that already. You know, there's so many great speakers. <laughs> so you're saying that it's important for Jericho, the Jericho coalitions to have a program, a continuing program of exposing the fact that there are political prisoners in the jails, and how do we fight to you know, get amnesty? No, yeah. Well, the amnesty and the political prisoners is to distinguish political prisoners from criminality. Mm -hmm. But the way to distinguish political prisoners from criminality is to, to acknowledge that there was a war. Right. That's one thing. And it's still going on. And it's, now, the, the second thing is the war. What is the war? Is the war just against political prisoners? No. no. Political prisoners don't fall from the sky. Mm -hmm. We come from the masses. Mm -hmm. And so from this second level of the war going on, where do we most clearly see the war? The fact that when, just like in Africa, people would turn around in the, in, 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 in the village and say, well, where's uh, Makunga? Where is Akinyele? Where did they go? Somebody took them on a ship, they go far, far away, we don't see them for 30 or 40 years. Well, who is the ship here? And who's taking them away here? And where are they going? They're not going across the sea. They're putting them in these prisons all over. Mm -hmm. That's the most clear sign of racism is that crack law. Mm -hmm. And it is no, you can't skip and dance around that. And they're going away for 30, 40, 50 years for nothing. And you won't have no people. So 
Esau has the second level. That's the wall. That's a, a, a clear indication of war. Sure, there's a wall of poverty. We need to be fighting that. You know? We need to be fighting the education. We need to get our children up to a much more technological advanced development. The computerization, the speed of information is moving like that. We're far behind time when, you know, we need the collective school system. You know, we need to do something about the fratricidal contradiction, the fighting and the wars between the youth. But the only way that they, we can give leadership is show some guts. We gotta show some history or whatever you call it. We need to be boxer. We can't just milk toe. They're not following us no more. And so fighting issues that affect them vigorously is what's gonna help that war. And it's gonna put more people in jail. Because when you fight, you that's the consequences of fight. And what are we gonna do? So a good defense is a good offense. Do you, is it also your view that the huge majority of people in jail are political prisoners, whether they're conscious of it or not? No. I think the huge majority of people in jail are political victims. I think that there are a lot more political prisoners than we acknowledge. Yeah, who became but political they are, prisoners. But they, they are, they, they are political awareness because there was no movement on the streets to make them aware. The issues in jail have made them more politically mm -hmm. aware. Mm -hmm. And so, just as on the streets, when you take a stand, a principal stand against repression, you must, you eventually have to sacrifice. Well, in prison, it's the same thing. And when you see them take that stand, understanding that they will sacrifice, then you have some kind of respect for their integrity and have to give respect to their commitment to more than just themselves. So that's, that's how I see that, you see. And there are some people who have been political uh, before they came to prison who were involved in underground economy or, you know, some kind of activity to survive who have maintained political principles and done the right thing inside these walls. And I'm not trying to make the prison movement the only part of our struggle, but it's so, it's so very important, so very clear that you can't get around that. You can't get around that. You can't, it's just like, and I want to get to um, the methadone, the drug I'm making these eyes. when everybody smoked reefer, when it was not, if you were busted for that kind of stuff, you would be put on the Rockefeller program. If you didn't go on the Rockefeller program, you had to go to jail. So people opt for the Rockefeller program. Mm -hmm. And so when they opt for the Rockefeller program, they end up being put on methadone. And so we, we said to ourselves, well, what kind of sense is that man? Somebody who's never did anything with smoke reefer, who's busted with some reefer on them, opts for the Rockefeller program as opposed to, as opposed to going in a year and a half in Roger's Island or something like that, ends up being put on a methadone program with 4 milligrams of methadone a day. Where is this coming from? That was so clear, chemical warfare, that it was easy to explain to the masses. It was, it was evident that Eli Lilly, Rockefeller, the whole combination working together, and again, United New York State Senate, the New York State uh, uh, Legislature, voting in the Rockefeller program, and then get federal funds for it. And he addicted all of the black and Puerto Rican people to methadone. Well, why are you going to addict them to methadone? Mm -hmm. Because they knew where everybody was. They were able to addict a whole population. Mm -hmm. And so then chemical warfare was so clear and blatant that you, we had to fight the drug war in order to expose this country's intent. And so in 1970, 
one, we opened up the Lincoln Detox Acupuncture Drug Unit. Okay, who's the we? The we is a man by the name of Franklin Apfel, uh, a man by the name of Walter Bosque, uh, myself, and Franklin Apfel, Walter Bosque. I got one by the name of, her name is Saul now, uh, but her name is Ife. Mm. And um, I'm trying to think, Maria, Sister Maria. They were all part of the uh, acupuncture collective, mm. where we began to use nurses' aides, counselors, and one doctor to begin to investigate the possible use of acupuncture for drugs, heroin, cocaine, opiates, as well as methadone withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happened was, in 1971, uh, I had two children that were in an accident, a car accident. And they were uh, paralyzed. Both of them were paralyzed. And I had a meaningful relationship with a group down on the Lower East Side called Iwakum, which was an Asian aggressive group through Yuri Kochiyama, Nobuko Miyamoto, Sue, a whole bunch of my friends down there. Um, and so uh, I was, the children were in the hospital for about a month, paralyzed, they couldn't walk. I just couldn't accept that. And uh, one day I went down to Iwakum and they were always had people services that that whole tendency had continued in, in the community. Uh, and so there was a woman, an old woman there from China who was using a, a treatment modality called Matsubushi on the old, the Chinese who come from the old country who didn't like taking medication. And this moxibustin is the herb that smells somewhat like marijuana. And it's a very strong smell. And I said, I came into the office, I said, what's that? And they said uh, that people get treated. And uh, treated for what? And so they, you know, different arthritis and stuff like that. And so I asked the lady, would she be willing to treat my sons? And she said that she, you know, uh, through the translator, that she would. So uh, I, out of uh, Mary Immaculate Hospital, we took them down, down to Iwakum for a whole month. And she used moxibustion on them. And after a month, they both were able to walk. Uh, one's uh, speech was slurred, but 95% recovery. After the doctors, the Western doctors said they couldn't. And at the time, I was working at Lincoln Detox. So I was like, that's it. If we could do that for the foundation, then mm -hmm. we can have it. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember, uh, drug withdrawal is all, it is clearly about the withdrawal of the drug, off the drug itself. But back then, heroin uh, addiction also had a, a, a powerful secondary symptoms effect, liver deterioration, spleen deterioration, kidney deterioration. Now, all of these things created secondary symptoms. And this uh, acupuncture thing was like mean on the secondary symptoms. So most people, if they wanted to get off the drugs, even though the withdrawal was uh, off the drugs was successful, the secondary symptoms would create the pain and discomfort that they would run back to the drug in order to alleviate the secondary symptom. So the acupuncture was able to deal with the secondary symptoms so when they were detoxified off the drugs that they wouldn't have the secondary symptoms would not call them back for the drug. You follow what I'm saying? Those of us who, you know, but anyway. And I think that uh, we took it uptown to the Bronx and um, we got in touch with uh, various people around the world to try to find out about it. Frank and Amphil did a lot of calling and we all, you know, reached out for different people. And we finally got in touch with uh, a man named Mario Oscar Wetzel, 
His son's name was Mario Wetzel. And Mario Wetzel was the head of the Montreal Acupuncture Association. And his father was a head of the International Association of Acupuncture and the United Nations representative of the World Health Organization on Acupuncture. And so we, uh, we felt that we had made inroads into the acupuncture community. And he came down to our clinic. And when we first started acupuncture, treatment. The acupuncture treatment was initially acupressure. And so we were learning different points on the body. And people would come up to the clinic and we would say, listen, we want to try something out on you. And by the time between the Young Lords Party and, mm -hmm. and the Black Panther Party and Atrium, and we had trust in the Bronx like nothing else. It was, if they didn't do anything, they trusted us in the Bronx and at Lincoln Hospital and Lincoln Detox in particular. And so when the uh, uh, patients or victims would come up, we would say, well, listen, we're not going to give you no methadone today, but what we're going to do is massage your feet, mm -hmm. massage your back, and we massage your ears. And what we would use, we're going to use our finger. And so, oh, from 71 to 72, approximately, before we even got needles, we would, people would come up to the Bronx, dope fiends, hardened dope victims. We would massage their ears, and massage their hands and their legs, and we would stand there with our fingers in their ears or in the different points, and we'd do deep breathing, and they'd fall right out to sleep, and just relax, and then the next day they'd be back for that treatment. And we would detoxify people off of them heroin and cocaine and methadone with acupressure, a lot of love, a lot of commitment to it. And it was some of the most rewarding times of our lives, you know. And it was, it was just great. It was just great. It was spirited. And we then began to get the needles and learn needle insertions and how to deal with various symptoms. And, um, as opposed to a lot of acupuncturists at the time were Western doctors who learned what we call push-button acupuncture. And push-button acupuncture we call is based upon the fact that if you say, well, I have a cold, and they have a point on the, on the ear or on the body, this is a good cold point. You know, you get your needle in there and your cold is supposed to go away. Well, we resisted that. We always wanted to go fear it. Of acupuncture. And so the Chinese theory of acupuncture and the French training of acupuncture, because our sponsor school was from Montreal, so we were learning from the French or in Niger and all of them, we began to understand the theory of acupuncture. And in understanding the theory of acupuncture, it gave us a very clear perspective of life. A lot of the people who were working on the drug victims were once drug victims themselves. And one of the things in the acupuncture theory is the five element theory. And the five element theory talks about things evolving. Things always change, that you always move from one quality to another quality and this process is what keeps the universe and the human being in connection and that lesson of constant change constant growth and decline and incline was very good for our revolutionary spirit because Lincoln Detox was a revolutionary drug organization and so we never allowed ourselves to be comfortable with just treating. We had to advocate. We had to expose the drug war. And so after we became proficient in treating and understood the theory of methanol and where it came from and how Hitler had developed it and how 
the uh, Food and Drug Administration had kidnapped the, I mean, had uh, uh, kidnapped the, the, the formula and had sold it to Rockefeller, and how Rockefeller's family had then sold it to Eli Lilly, and then Eli Lilly, and then Rockefeller then opened up the the Rockefeller program and brought Eli Lilly back into the game with state-sponsored acupunct, I mean, and methadone uh, uh, clinics and the, the major stocks in it. So we were able to expose the genocide war of the methadone in relationship to the acupuncture, I mean, in relationship to the drug. And so uh, uh, plagues and the, and the influx of drugs and the CIA, we began to advocate. And so in, in advocating, the revolutionary organizations at Lincoln, Lincoln D, uh, the Black Young Girls Party, the remnants of the Black Panther Party, which was the National Committee for the Defense of Political Prisoners, and remnants of the Republican of Africa, and uh, Atrium, and the East, and the various groups that were, uh, were instructors and counselors up at, uh, up at Lincoln D. Time. We became a target of the state. Mayor Koch, if you remember, was the head of the Board of Estimates. Mm -hmm. at the, in, in 75, from 74 up to 76, 77. Mayor Cox's major thrust into being a mayor was that he was going to get rid of these poverty pimp drug programs. Mm -hmm. And so he began to attack all of the Synanon and Dave Top, or which are called therapeutic programs that the federal government was giving money uh, to in order to fight the drug uh, play. The Addiction Services Agency was a part of the state. And the National Institute of uh, Drug Withdrawal was the feds. And so uh, Koch and Charles Schumer, if you all know Charles Schumer, a very influential congressman today, were all a part of this uh, attack on drug programs in order to sh expose state spending, government spending under the Mayor Beam and, and the like. And so his attack on the drug program, and in particular Lincoln Detox, catapulted him into the limelight around saving money, real thrifty on money in the city of New York. And so the Lincoln Detox program, they charged with, they tried to stop the acupuncture program at Lincoln Detox basically saying that we had no protocol. We had a protocol. Okay, and at the time, this became like in 74, 75, Richard Tab, uh, Franklin Abdel had left, and Richard Tab, who was the grandson of President Tab, was our doctor, the MD, on staff at the time. And Richard Tab was the reason we were able to continue the research protocol without intervention because he had it, he was a licensed MD. The National Conference of Labor Committee, who was under La Roche, the La Roche Pharmaceuticals, with Charles Schumer, was the so-called hot dog investigators going around investigating drug programs. So at, the, at that time, May, uh, President Nixon had been to China and had, had opened up this whole acupuncture thing in China. He was opening up this whole thing. Peter Bourne, who was uh, at the time head of the National Institute, director of the National Idol, he became the international surveyor of acupuncture and drug withdrawal in, in, in the world for the uh, United Nations. And so he was going around reviewing all of these drug programs. So on one particular day, Charles Schumer and the Roche Organization, which is the National Caucus of Labor Committee, had made a big public announcement that they were going to investigate the corruption at Lincoln Detox. At the same day, Peter Bourne was coming in representing the federal government 
and investigating the proficiency and the capabilities of acupuncture and drug control in Lincoln Detox. All hell broke loose. That night they killed Richard Taft. Richard Taft was found shot up with drugs, left in the back of the auditorium. In fact, it was Peter Bourne who saw the body at the time that we were doing the tour. Schumer and the National Caucus of Labor Committee was out at the Lincoln Hospital with all of these, they had been known for a while, attacking the Mama Barack, or attacking a whole lot of people, going around with moon chuckers beating on people. They had, a, they, were, they had come up to attack the program. So it was a melee all out in the streets of Lincoln Detail. That is the type of atmosphere, that is the type of struggle we had. And at the time, Stanley Cohen, attorney Stanley Cohen was our attorney. He was also a silence attorney in the last part of her trial. He was also found dead just before she was to go on trial in Jersey after winning these cases. Lincoln Detox was an a cornerstone of counterintelligence against what was left of the remnants of very significant movements in the New York area. And also that it represented a very viable, realistic attack against chemical warfare. Because I think if it wasn't for Lincoln T. Tox's overt stand nationally, internationally, and locally against methadone, we would have had much more of a penetration of methadone in the cities, in the, in the cities of, of America and around the world. I think that we exposed it. We were able to detoxify people off of methadone quicker. We were able to stop crib deaths quicker with children who were dying from parents who were addicted to methadone because they had not mm -hmm. understood their relationship to it. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that social and political activity along with acupuncture would help detoxify people off the drugs quicker than just methadone detoxification. Did this lead to your arrest? This led to my being targeted. Okay. And, and I was uh, fired from Lincoln Detox at that time. Mm -hmm and sent to, uh, well, I was fired, it took 30 police and you know, took mm -hmm. us away from Lincoln Detox. I mean, during the course of that time, we, we'd had some very, you know, we, we supported the Carlos Feliciano, the National mm -hmm. the Defendants Movement. Mm -hmm. our, our, our program had a prisoner fund by, that we supported people in, in, in various movements. We uh, supported all the Silas cases, all the Rubens cases, New York cases. We did everything we could to show the victims gave back, I mean, the, the drug victims gave back to the community some of the things that we supported, the Egyptian cab struggle. We, we helped, we built the Black and Puerto Rican Coalition and construction work. We built the Welfare Rights Organization at Wilson Burger. All of these came from the victims we becoming politicized and trying to give back into their community more uh, from what they had taken out. And so we became a thorn. In fact, there was no movement, organizational movement, between 73 and 77, that was, or 72 and 77, that was as significant as Lincoln D. Time outside of the East. Mm -hmm. I mean, between the Black Panther Party, the Republican of Africa, Adrian, I mean, the cornerstone was there at Lincoln Hospital. It was a hell of a place. It mm -hmm. was a hell of a period. It was always serve the people and fight the enemy, fight the pigs. It was mm -hmm. a great place. And that's where Tupac grew up. Okay, do you want to say a few words about Tupac and the legacy that he leaves, well, especially for young people today, and anything behind his killing, murder? Well, like I said before, I think that um, I get a little emotional because I've been separated from my children. And I think most of us political prisoners have been separated uh, from our children. Uh, I think that that's a consequence of COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. And that's a consequence of struggle. I think that a movement, our movement has not been able to compensate for that 
absence. And I think that where people might romanticize about who we are, our children who were targeted and harassed, who were followed, who were, you know, put in fearful situations because, like myself, I was clandestine for many years and on the run. And so my daughter and my sons were always followed and, and you know, they go into their schools. and So they knew the reality of what this is. Uh, Tupac wasn't so-called bad guy just to be bad. Uh, I don't think, uh, or angry just to be angry. I think his mother's life as a, as a member of the Panther 21 and the Panther situation, his growing up in Lincoln Hospital with us, you know, that whole struggle to be public. He grew up around those things all his life, you know, and he grew up in, in, in you know, in the, the tension of what we were going through with these various counterintelligence operations. And I think that, um, uh, In a better world, we could have done better with that anger. Mm -hmm. In a better world, in a better circumstances. But I think he did the best that he could. Mm -hmm. I think that we all need a chance to grow. And um, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him because he is, was one genius. Mm -hmm. His, you know, creative, he tried to put his pain into his art and give voice to that pain that so many other people create. Mm -hmm. And I think that to, um, to this new wave, whenever they evolve to take over for months, his impact will have a significant influence on them. His, his art, his words, his, his bodaciousness and his view of things will, will clearly be uh, a reality that must be analyzed in the context of that movement's development. I think he articulated so many things and so many feelings in, in such an artistic way that history will indicate that he is a barometer of this element. He will definitely be a barometer. Mm -hmm. of this element, and for that, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him, and I think that um, we must learn that this is a, a war. This is a war that affects everyone in it. We don't want people to join up and think it's a quick fix. You know, mm -hmm. this is a long, arduous struggle, mm -hmm. but it's a glorious one, because it's right. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's what we should do. We should do no less. The people who died off those ships would expect nothing less. The people who survived those ships would expect nothing less. And so, although this is a rough, you know, we got to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got to do it. And so, I think that the hip hop nation is a nation that is trying to define for itself. I think we should help it define some better goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. I think we should give it, I think we should give it a chance to evolve and mature, and I think we should give it some insight. And I think that they're going to get a healthy dose of repression. Mm -hmm. But because they're not cognizant of their own consolidation, they don't feel it right now. You know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I know that they will be the vanguard of the next wave. Mm -hmm. And I think the counterintelligence, the assassination of Tupac and the assassination of Big Eating, mm -hmm. the jury's still out on why. Mm -hmm. But we know that the government was around them consistently. Mm -hmm. We know that. Mm -hmm. We know that the ATF, the FBI, and, and the life was in Tupac's caravan at the time. And regular off-duty police. No response to the shooters. No foul, no foot chase, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that they had taken pictures of Biggie's car a couple of minutes before he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
nothing. And I think that uh, we will have, in the end, you know some answers. I think we have an obligation to have some answers. But I think that the main thing we need to do is to teach of the lesson and not allow it to divide the coasts like we're involved in some kind of serious tribalism or some Bantusism to do it, get, end up like Namibia and I mean, uh, 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 I mean Angola and, and the like and kill it and that kind of nonsense. We can't have that. And I think we should fight against that. And I think we will. I think we will. Okay, in the time that we have left, um, I think what was really came through with, you know, um, all this rich wisdom and uh, history that you've given, you know, our viewers, is that, you know, the need to have a united front with all different kinds of organizations. You talked about the RNA, the Panthers, the New African Independence Movement, the Young Lords, the fact that you all work together despite any political differences or different programs, mm -hmm. you saw the need to have Absolutely. a united front. And I think that's very important for, you know, young activists and even veteran activists who may, you know, have been a little discouraged, you know, over the years. I think it's important for them to hear this message from someone like you. you I know? think we carry too much old baggage. Mm -hmm. I think in the, in the 60s and the 70s, it was the Marxists against the Nationals. It was the Integrationists against the Separatists uh, in the 50s and the 60s. In the 70s, it was the class struggle against the, you know. I think people still carry those issues. I think that the National Liberation Front has resolved within itself that we have people who believe that the class struggle is a significant struggle within the black liberation struggle. We also have people who believe that the struggle for land and independence is the very significant part and important part of that struggle. But I think that under the National Liberation Front, we agree that we can all and we must function together. Mm -hmm. So that's why this front is so important to us that it has emerged from us as prisoners. Hopefully that's a guiding light. We have people with old baggage, old suspicions, but when you have to sacrifice like we sacrifice, you realize to put certain contradictions in their proper perspective. And when you do that, I think that we can maximize what we do have in common. We shouldn't be liberal. We shouldn't let uh, jackanapes or whatever you call it run rampant. We shouldn't have people uh, disrespecting people's integrity and character without valid criticism. But we don't think that people's different view of where we're going is in fact a contradiction. It is a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction written in blood. It's a contradiction that we struggle for in order to get to where we're going, okay? And when you believe in what you believe in, you can stand on that. And you can stand on that based upon your work. Put your work first, you know, we need dreamers. You know, you, you know we need dreamers. We need people who will put that vision into practice. We need people who will understand that that practice is what's going to guide the future. Without the practice, it's just a bunch of hot air in theory. So, you know, aim high and go all out. You know, that's, uh, that's my position. And also, do you just want to, I mean, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to send this tape to Asada Shakur in Cuba. He and I met with her when we were in Cuba last um, year for the World Youth Festival. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, do you want to send a message to Asada, you know, who's yeah. such an inspiration to yeah. all of us? Asada uh, and Nahanda. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked the other day. We had a radio interview. You should get the copy of mm -hmm. it. Beautiful interview. I believe that Asada and Nahanda must be supported. I believe that Asada Nahanda represents an international foreign affairs office for our movement, different than in any other situation, because Cuba is a very important example. We always anticipate, and I'll try to make this quick, the Cuban people represent a spirit 
of character that their collective consciousness. And they have something to be proud of, that they have stand, stood up against the biggest bully in the, in, in, in the world. Right. And they have suffered from it, but that suffering allows them to walk very proudly when they come to the Olympics or when they, any time they're represented on the world front. The Cuban people walk with pride and they're looked on as pride. A lot of things that we look for, the Lexus, the Mercedes, and all of these things, Asana and Nahani have shown that they can be quality people, give to a struggle, have quality life, be an inspiration to us, absent these material things we so strive for. We have to, as a people, develop something that gives our spirit the integrity that our prayer, our friendship merits and our existence merit. And I think that we need to look for something in us to give us that kind of fortitude. And Asada and Nahanda, the work that they're doing in Cuba, the support from black people, of black people all over America love Cuba because they stand up, but they love Cuba even more because our heroes are there and they're living like human beings and giving quality to their life and lives of other people. And so I'm so proud of them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just flabbergasted, you know, mm -hmm. because that's how it's supposed to be. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. On June 30th of 1998, an appeal for a new evidentiary hearing was filed in federal court in New York for Dr. Mutulu Shakur and co-defendant Marilyn Buck. The appeal centered around two themes. First, the only witness that connected Dr. Shakur or Ms. Buck to crimes was Tyrone Rison, And it was shown that Rison had perjured himself during the trial when he untruthfully denied removing an M16 weapon from Fort Bragg that was later implicated in the death of a bank guard in the Bronx. If this had come out during the trial, it would have shown Rison to be an unreliable witness. Second, the government claimed that during the trial they had no surveillance reports on the defendants, when in fact Claude Strickland, an NYPD undercover cop, now retired, had produced 200 such reports on Dr. Shakur, and not a one of those reports showed any criminal activity. The the refusal to turn over the documents, Michael Tarif Warren, Mutu's attorney, said, violates Dr. Shakur's constitutional rights. Exculpatory evidence cannot be kept from the hands of the defendant. It was Rudolph Giuliani, then federal attorney, now the mayor, who congratulated the agencies for their collaboration in the Joint Terrorist Task Force, and it was these agencies that made this frame-up come about. No evidence in itself indicated criminality, Jill Sophia Elijah, another attorney, told the judge. It was only Rison's testimony. When the judge asked if the talk about the M16 rifle, quote, removed, unquote, from Fort Bragg wasn't just peripheral, Ms. Elijah replied, no. It was the only weapon linked ballistically to any crime scene, the murder in the Bronx, and only Tyrone Rison was guilty of that. Tyrone Rison has since disappeared into the Federal Witness Protection Program and was never charged with the death of the Bronx bank guard. The jury didn't know he was lying about the gun, Jonathan LaBelle summed up later, another attorney. The power of Strickland's police reports would have changed the outcome of the case. He pointed to similar misconduct by prosecution and police in the cases of Geronimo Gijaga Pratt and Daruba bin Wahad. Once they received the reports, they got out, he said. Only your help and support can free Dr. Mutulu Shakur. Please join us in this struggle. <laughs>